is the National Security Council really the ultimate backdoor into Stanford? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I'm just going to paraphrase David Brooks, who says, I only teach at institutions that I could have not have gotten into. <laughs> <laughs> but what was it like waking up in Palo Alto last Wednesday uh, as opposed to being in Washington for all the Mueller mania and whatever? Did you, when you woke up that morning, did you feel somewhat blessed and relieved? Well, we don't realize it's very arduous there in Palo Alto, in the Stanford, <laughs> in the Hoover. No, I mean, it was, it was, it was quite a change, obviously. And, uh, but, you know, I'd been through this pattern ac across my career of, of challenging assignments, uh, some of them in, in combat, and then an opportunity which the military gives you and our army gives you in, in particular, I think, is an opportunity to then reflect on that challenging experience and to read and think and learn and discuss and write and prepare yourself for the next level of responsibility. So it, it felt like a natural transition to me. Given your illustrious military career, your academic career, your policy career, uh, what was more daunting and gut-wrenching, uh, cresting a hill in the Middle East to find more Iraqi tanks in front of you than you had with you at the time, or sitting on that couch in 2017 next to President Trump, having accepted a job that repeatedly people had passed over and looking at all the media at that time? Uh, how did you feel? Well, you know, I, I, I felt grateful for the opportunity to continue serving. In many ways, uh, the, the, my duties and responsibilities as assistant to the president for national security was a bonus round for me, right? I had served in the army by that time for you know, 33 years, and I was on a path to retiring from, from the army, wasn't sure what we were gonna do. But my phone rang, and it was, it was, the, it was the, the White House, and, and, uh, and asking me if I could go to Mar-a-Lago the next day for an interview, so it really came out of the blue. But then as I had you know, at least a few moments to reflect on my career, I was very grateful for, I think, many opportunities that help prepare somebody as much as anybody can be prepared for a job of such broad scope and responsibility. And as a military officer, what's the primary motivation here? Is it more your kind of supreme can-do confidence, having been thrown a lot of other challenges and having to figure it out and accomplish the mission? Or was it kind of an intense sense of patriotism knowing where the country was at the time. Well, I, I just think that any opportunity to serve is a privilege, you know? And, and I think that maybe sometimes in our society today, we tend to look at service in the military through, uh, I think, the, the lens of popular culture. And I think these days, popular culture tends to cheapen and coarsen uh, military service and the, and the warrior ethos in, in particular. And, and what service in our military, what service in our intelligence agencies, in our government broadly, gives you an opportunity to do is to be part of something bigger than yourself and to be part of a team in our military in which the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives for you. And so I think that there are these less tangible rewards that it's difficult for people, to, that are difficult for people to see. Sounds like a great plan. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> It was so, like clockwork. Like clockwork. clockwork. Yeah, where they say the, the enemy always has a vote on any plan. All right, so you, you cross the line of departure. Game on. So as this things start to transpire now, uh, how much of that process uh, were you able to maintain? Any big organization, as all of you, I'm sure, know, is not without friction and difficult you know, personalities and relationships and so forth. But, but I really thought our team did a very good job of keeping our eye on that mission. As a lieutenant general and as a national security advisor, where was your ultimate loyalty? To the president or to the Constitution and the Congress? Well, it's clear to the Constitution of the United States, right? I mean, so that's what's different uh, about us is that, is that we, nobody, nobody swears allegiance to a king or a president, right? All of us who are sworn into federal office across all departments and agencies are sworn to support the Constitution of the United States. General, thank you for your service Thanks. on the battlefield and inside the Beltway. Thanks. Thank you.